first uh, reading this morning is uh, from Psalms 36, verses 5 through 10. And that's on page 483 for those that wish to follow along. <laughs> no, that's right, Alan. Thy steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Thy faithfulness to the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the mountains of God. Thy judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, thou savest, O Lord. How precious is thy steadfast love, O God. The children of men take refuge into the shadow of thy wings. Thy, thy feast on the abundance of thy house. And thou givest them drink from the river of their delights. For with thee in the fountain of life, and a light we do light. O oh, continue thy steadfast love to those who know thee, and thy salvation to upright of heart. The next reading is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 21, and that's on pages 986 and 987 for those that wish to follow. And this is a new life in Christ. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the peace given to me, I bid everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned him. For in one body we have many members, and all the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one, in, one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy or proportion in our faith, if service in our serving, he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who contrib contributes in liberty, he who gives age with zeal, he who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And this part talks about the marks of a true Christian. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor, Never flag in zeal, be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them, rejoice those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for those and noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink, for by so doing you will weep burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Please bless the reading of these holy words. The time is always ripe. The time is always right. There were three tourists who were talking about time, and they were at the top of Big Ben in London, and one of them said to the others, hey, I bet that I can throw my watch over and catch it before it hits the ground. And they're like, okay, you're on. 
So he threw it over the side and he heard it like crash to the ground within three minutes. He hadn't even gotten to the stairs. And the second one said, well, I'm going to try it too. So he threw his watch over the tower and went running for the stairs. And even before he'd gotten out of the door, he could hear it hit the ground. And uh, the third one threw her watch over and she ran down the stairs and went across to the coffee shop and had a cup of coffee and then sauntered back over and just caught it as it was hitting the ground. And they're like, hey, how did you do that? I mean, ours hit the ground so fast, how were you able to catch yours? And she said, oh, my watch is always 30 minutes slow. <laughs> so that's why it worked. That's, that's how time works. So uh, yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was 25 years old in 1982, I was in seminary at Boston University and I was invited to a clergy women's consultation in Glorieta, New Mexico, along with the other women who were in seminary. And uh, <laughs> women who were pastors from all over the country gathered in Glorieta, New Mexico. It was an amazing gathering. And, um, you know, there was a time change, and we had landed the night before and gotten up, and I hadn't missed breakfast because of, of adjusting to the time. And so I got to the luncheon first because, honestly, I was hungry. You know, I was 25 years old, and I was, wanted to eat all the time. And uh, the manager came out and looked at the line, at all of us lined up, and he started talking to me because I was first in line, and he's like, who are you? And I said, well, we're here for the luncheon. And he said, yeah, but I thought that I was going to have a luncheon for pastors. I didn't know it was going to be for the pastor's wives. If I had known it was for the wives, I would have made them salad or something like that instead of roast beef and mashed potatoes. And so I was standing there, and, you know, I was irritated with him on two counts. First of all, if he'd have given me a salad when I was so hungry, I would have eaten the plate and taken a bite out of the chair. So just the thought that he might have given me salad really made me mad. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, the assumption he made that this was all clergy wives. But uh, luckily, I didn't say too much for a couple of reasons. One, I already mentioned I was hungry. And I thought, never get into an argument with anyone when you're hungry, because it doesn't go well. And uh, secondly, I knew that this was the man that was going to determine whether I was going to get to go and eat or not. So I thought I'd better not alienate him. So all I said was, uh, yes, it was a very pleasant smile. Oh, yes, you know, we're all, we're all clergy standing here. It's from all over the country. We gathered here for this conference. And he said, all these women? And I said, yes. And he said, they're all pastors? And I said, yes. And he said, they're all serving churches? I said, well, some of us are still in school, but yeah, we all will. And he's like, well, that scares me. <laughs> um, well, he should have been scared. I know he should have been. Um, but, you know, I I've laughed at it in the years since. Uh, but that was one of my first experiences of prejudice as a woman minister, um, of being prejudged based on, you know, his previous experience without knowing me at all, knowing anything about me. Uh, he made an assumption about me. And you know what? We all do it. Because it's, that's the way our brain works. Our brain works in these big categories that we gather information of our previous experience or what we've read or what we see on TV, and we make judgments about people. Um, and our brain works like that because it's a primitive part of our brain. It works like that to keep us safe. You know, because that was, in the primitive times, that was one of the most important things about living to see the next day, was that you gather this information and you make instant judgments in order to be safe. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, it does benefit us. Like, when I'm driving in Boston, you know, my prejudice is that the Boston drivers after the light turns green for me that two or three more cars are going to go through going the other way. Um, I'm always assuming that they're going to run 
the red light. Um, and so that keeps me safe. You know, even though I don't know each individual driver and I don't know if they're going to run the red light, but enough Boston drivers have tried to get through on the tail end when the yellow light has turned from pink to orange to actually red, um, that that kind of prejudgment on my part about Boston drivers does keep me safe. Um, and sometimes it benefits me. One time when I was flying to Indianapolis and I had a presentation right when I got off the plane, I was going to be picked up and go right to it, so I had on a business suit, you know, which is not something I normally wear. And I noticed people were treating me so deferentially on the plane. Oh, can I help you? Oh, here's your seat. Oh. And all of a sudden I realized it was because of what I had on. And the woman next to me said, so you must be a lawyer. I'm like, yeah. So, I mean, I think that was a positive assumption about me. It's just, um, so, uh, so sometimes we benefit from people's prejudices. Sometimes um, our uh, prejudices benefit us because it keeps us safe. Um, but sometimes it's more difficult to deal with that prejudgment that we all do, that happens. Um, my husband and I were out visiting his family in Michigan, and his dad had been sick, so we took two different cars out because uh, we had to come back at different times, or we had to go out there at different times. We came back at the same time. And when we came back, I was driving with our son and his friend, and they were adolescents. And my husband was driving with our daughter, my husband has kind of dark hair. Our daughter had blonde hair and green eyes, and her best friend was from Puerto Rico, so she had very dark hair, dark eyes. And so I went through without a hitch. They just let me go, hi, what are you doing? Yeah. And when my husband came through, he had to pull out all of his documents. They had him pull over. They took him out of the car. They searched the whole car. They checked everyone's identification. They checked the two girls' identification. And he was like, wow, I wonder, did they think that I had kidnapped them or something? <laughs> kidnapped these uh, two girls that were in the car with me? Uh, so that was difficult. But you know what? It, it really wasn't that bad because um, it delayed him half an hour. It was inconvenient, but it really didn't hurt him that much. Um, but sometimes our prejudices can really do serious harm. Uh, there's a woman named Joy DeGry, and she's an author and educator, and she went shopping at her local Safeway with her sister-in-law, Kathleen. And Kathleen is blue-eyed and blonde-haired, and Joy is African-American, she's black. And Joy's 10-year-old daughter was with them. They were all there together. And they went through the checkout line, and Kathleen went first, and the clerk was bantering with Kathleen, how's it going, what are you doing? And uh, Kathleen pulled out her checkbook, paid with the check, and the clerk took a look at it and said, okay, and you know, put it in the cash register, and Kathleen was done. And then. Joy came along right behind her and she said, you know, it was like she turned into a different person. She didn't even greet me. Uh, the only thing she spoke to me was um, she told me how much the bill was, how much the, uh, the register tape had added up to. And uh, Joy said, I wrote my check and I gave it to her. And she said, two forms of identification. And Joy's little 10-year-old daughter is saying, Mom, why did she do that? She didn't do that for Auntie Kathleen. And her mom's like, no, that's all right, honey. We're, that's okay. Don't make a scene. And so she showed her the two forms of ID. And then the woman said, oh, just a minute. And she got out the bad check register. And she started look, looking for Joy's driver's license in the bad check register. And then Joy's little daughter like had tears in her eyes, and she's crying, and she goes, Mom. Mom, what's going on? And Kathleen had noticed uh, what was happening. And she turned around and she said to the cashier, why are you doing that? And the cashier said, it's our policy. And Kathleen said, but you didn't do it to me. And she said, oh, but I know you. And Kathleen says, you know, I've been coming here for three months. She's been coming here for 20 years. So she's the one you should know. And then uh, 
there were two other ladies in the line behind her and they were like, they were elderly ladies and they were kind of listening to what had happened. They're like, honey, you shouldn't do that. That's not right. And uh, they started to talk to the cashier about it. Um, and they all had a conversation about this experience and everybody went home after that. Uh, but Joy said she thought about that for a long time, you know, how for her daughter, it could have turned into something that was horrible but because of the way Kathleen responded, because of the way the two ladies who were Anglo, they were white in the line behind her, supporting her, that it turned into an education for her daughter. It turned into a positive experience of acknowledging and confronting prejudice, of, of being kind and gentle to each other, but being honest in, and raising um, issues of truth. So, uh, so we're all prejudiced, because that's the way our brain works. We all prejudge situations. We all prejudge people. And sometimes it doesn't do harm. You know, it's just the way it happens. Other times it can be a painful experience. But when we act on that prejudgment without other information, that's when it rises to the level of an ism. So, for example, if you think that you're going to hire someone and you make an assumption that someone who's older won't have the technology skills, that's a prejudice. But if you don't hire that person, then it becomes ageism. If you don't associate with someone else because of a race, then that's a prejudice. And uh, there's a loss there. But it does real harm if you're in charge of deciding who gets a loan from the bank or deciding who to hire in your business or who to show certain houses when you're a real estate agent selling homes. Then that's when it becomes racism. That man who you know, made an assumption that we were all clergy wives, that was a prejudice. And it didn't really harm me at all. But if he had decided in his church that he was going to vote against me to be their pastor because uh, he thought that I wouldn't be up to the job, uh, then that would have been sexism. And um, we've made so much progress in our country, in our laws, that help everyone to be one family and to have uh, legal rights. Um, in front of the judge or in front of the courts. But we haven't done so well in the human arena. We still have so far to go. And uh, sometimes it seems like it may be getting worse. Paul has a word to speak to us. He says, do not be conformed to your world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not live like everyone else is living, like you see in society with the Twitter wars and the Facebook wars and the way that we are divided into camps, into enclaves, into hierarchies and positions. Do not be conformed to this world, what everybody else is doing, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind because you are called by higher authority. You are called by a higher authority than uh, the public opinion or the uh, politicians or the movie stars or the people that seem to be in authority in our culture. You're called by a higher authority and that is by Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus says to us that we should live humbly. We should live humbly and be aware that we're not just individuals but we're part of a greater body and all the gifts are required to make the body whole. And if we're missing some of the gifts then the body isn't going to be whole and we're not going to be able to progress together as spiritual beings under the leadership of God in Christ Jesus. So that's what the scripture says to us that comes from us, you know, not from last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, but from 2,000 years ago from 
the words of Paul who was in communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. Let love be genuine, he says. Wow, these words ring out through the years. Let love be genuine, abhor evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Like we're part of the same family, like we're all in one family. That's what Jesus is asking of us. And it's hard enough, you know, it was hard enough to do it in Jesus' time, but we're called to live it in our time because this is the right time. This is when the time is right to do what is right. And we can always say, oh, it's going to happen someday. You know, if we keep praying, oh, it's going to happen someday. God is going to come and God is going to help us be one people someday. But you know what? We're not waiting for someday because today is the one day when it's right, when the time is right for each one of us to have our hearts transformed and to be renewed by Christ Jesus, to let the Holy Spirit live in us and to be a beacon of light to the world. And you know what? Our world is a mess. It is a mess. Our country is in a mess. We are so polarized. Aren't you afraid of what's going to happen? And it's time for us to say, the time is now. The time is right. The time is ripe for us. We are the fruit. We are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We're the fruit of Christ Jesus' power in our world and in our life. So I'm calling to each and every one of you. You're needed. You're needed. Your heart is needed. Your voice is needed. Your spirit is needed. Your action is needed because it's the right time. The time is right, right now. Amen. Let us continue in worship in the name of love.
Thank you, Deb and Rick.